Okay, we are recording. Great. Um, so I'm trying to think about note taking here. Dwayne did it last time. Darcy did it before that. Sarah's juggling childcare and everything. So I don't think she's a good candidate for today. Um, and Ashwin's also juggling. So it looks like Steve or Andra, I'm gonna need to, to get one of you to be minute taker today, if you don't mind. I can. Great, thanks Steve, appreciate that. Just don't say anything important until I can get set up for it. Okay, <laughs> well, while you're getting set up, uh, everybody can review the minutes from last time. Give me a minute and I'll get those going. Thank you. Laughing at my cat, Dwayne. <laughs> yes, I'll study uh, Andra's cat instead of the minutes. Yeah, okay. Actually, I have a cat that looks, uh, it's, a, it's a yellow cat like that or orange. Cat like that. <laughs> I was on a call today with a colleague who, I guess her desk is under a lofted bed and there was a cat head like, hanging down from the, so it like it was hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> Stephanie, Stephanie, Hi. I want to yep. warn you that my, um, I, I probably will have to log out and come back in. So if you see me disappear, that's what's happening and look for me coming back in, coming back in. and if if i don't respond right away just shoot me a text because i have my phone right. right here so i'll probably yeah. see that before i see you trying to get in all right can you all read those okay a little small uh okay i'm trying to i've got it laid out on two pages so let me see if i can get one page and then i'll Good. Yeah, and you can maybe um, at the bottom right, it looks like you can make it a little bit bigger. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Is that good? Yeah, thank you. I wasn't in that, on that meeting with Lynn Griesmer, so you should probably take me out of there uh, under number four. Oh, it was supposed to be Andra. I'll just change you to Andra. Okay. And on the last point in that section, um, it says regarding the health policy, but it should be the housing policy. <laughs> Uh, Quick typing there. Yeah. <laughs> if I got everything down. Sorry, where is that, Laura? It's the last sentence of that number four. Yep, got it.
I move we accept the minutes. Second. Okay. Um, do a roll call vote. Drucker? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Roof? Yes. Dumont? Yes. Rose? Yes. Durr? Yes. Ravi Kumar? I don't know if you're with yes. us. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Minutes are approved. Thank you. Oh, you're you're muted, Laura. Sorry, thanks. Um, so it does, does look like we have one public participant. I don't know, Annalise, you wanna raise your hand if you wanna make any comments or if you're just listening in, that's fine too. I think she's covering us for the indie. Okay. All right, well, I'll try to keep an eye on that in case she raises her hand. Um, all right, so next up, I think is staff updates. So um, yeah, I just wanted to let you all know that the um, wetlands <laughs> coverage is proving to be extraordinarily time consuming. So um, just, you know, bear with me. <laughs> so. Um, that's why I like Steve, I saw your message, but I couldn't even get to it. So, um, so I apologize, but I'll, I'm hoping um, the next, the meeting tonight is not so bad. The meeting for the 10th is not too bad either. So hopefully I'll be able to sort of get a little bit caught up with some of that stuff. The meeting on the 24th is gonna be a big one. So I'm, I said, I'm kind of going out with a bang for the wetlands work because that's my last meeting helping them out. So. Um, but that'll be a big meeting, which may or may not, I may or may not have to do follow up depending on where Erin is with her return. So, and I don't want to bombard her either. So um, I'm just letting you all know that's kind of what's going on. Thanks, Stephanie. And do let us know if there's anything we can do to make your life easier on our end. Thank you. I doubt there is, but <laughs> you're all doing a great job. Okay, great. So uh, moving on to ECAC member updates. Got quite a few things on the agenda, so maybe everything's covered there. All right, so um, item five, CARP Linnaean progress update. Stephanie, do you wanna lead this discussion? Sure, um, so um, I had been in touch with uh, Laura and Jim and they had requested that we actually move the um, draft review from the 19th to March 5th because they have quite a bit. Um, Laura has quite, uh, Lauren has quite a bit that she's working on. And so it seems like she'd be able to have more substantial information to us. She doesn't want to give it to us in bits and pieces. So um, that's the big update. And then um, there's a revised timeline that goes along with that. And I'm sorry, I think I had it. I had it open to share, but there is a revised timeline for everything, but you should know, Laura, are you seeing if you have it? Um, you should know that that doesn't change our end goal, which is to get something, you know, by, um, by mid-May to the 
town council, which we had changed. Originally, we had said April, but we knew that that was not going to work, um, even when we were talking about just having the drafts put together. So uh, this, uh, thank you, Laura. So this is the revised timeline. So um, everything has to be submitted to the MVP program by June 30th. So essentially everything has to be done pretty much by mid-May. So if there's anything, you know, any comments from the town council for whatever reason, and not that I anticipate there's gonna be changes, but if there's anything that needs to be addressed, it just gives that little bit of a window of time to get it done before everything becomes finalized and submitted to the MVP program. So essentially it seems, you know, it seems like a little bit of a pushback uh, in terms of the timeline, but it's really not, it doesn't throw us off a whole lot really, it's just a little bit. Yeah, Darcy and then Andra. The reason uh, why we had initially tried to get it done by April was because the, the budget is presented on May 1st. Um, I don't know whether it's meaningful for us to do that because I'm guessing the first thing the town council will do is refer it to committees, um, refer pieces of it. Um, so I don't know whether it's still worth trying to get it done before May 1st. I don't think that's... So I think, I mean, I think that we, the report is the blueprint. And I think anything that's specific enough to be like, this is something we're asking for budget money for is something that we need to be working on right now. So I, and I don't think those two things are in conflict. Um, I think that, so I think that the report kind of like how we were talking last time with our big ideas, you know, I think we should try to identify some specific action items from that list that we're gonna take back to the council either through the budget reading process or th through the committees um, to try to push them to be actions that, that this council can take in this year. Um, those will all be complementary to the report because the report is gonna identify those as things we're doing, but those don't need to be written and finalized in the report in that level of detail. Um, so I don't think that it's an issue that the, that we'll be working sort of in, in parallel on some very specific items, whether those are items we bring to the budget or not, I think is a, far, a, long, a different discussion or a discussion we need to have. Um, you know, we've submitted some idea, budget ideas. We also know the budget is super tight and that what we really need is like, fundamental changes, which are probably not going to happen um, by May. And so we might just need to be priming for, for those. But I don't have, a, I've not been following those discussions. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, one of our budget requests last year and this year was for the resident to support the resident capital request. And I, I know that that has been Actually, I haven't gotten the update on that from Andra, who attended the JCPC Joint uh, Capital Planning Committee meeting last Thursday with the students. And do you have an update on that, Andra? Um, there was no decision taken there. We presented again, um, and they really had, you know, there was um, not very much new to, to say, and they'd kind of forgotten what was before. <laughs> so uh, I am, yeah, I don't have anything. Wasn't there a discussion, Darcy, during, and Andra and Ashwin, during the was it during the council meeting where one of the councilors suggested that that funding could come from somewhere else, or was that a different meeting? Uh, well, last year the 
JCPC meeting, um, there, there, there <laughs> um, Paul said maybe you could use the money that was for the CCA, um, but that's that's no. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we yeah. We, we also company has has worked with Dono, and maybe there will be some money for part of it. Yeah, but we don't have to talk about that now. It was Kathy S. I'm looking at your notes, Darcy, from that meeting. The residential capital. Oh yes, Kathy. Kathy, uh, we had at some point we had conversations about um, getting donations for it, um, trying to get matching funds. If you know, if the town put in this much, we try to get matching funds for the other amount. Um, and Paul uh, said not to go there because of the possibility for funding it. Um, so yeah, I think that there's some sympathy for funding it both in the JCPC and I think with the town manager. That's the impression that I get. I see a hand, Sarah. Hi. Um, all of these dates are a Friday, yeah? Yes. Um, so is the intent that we have comments by that upcoming Wednesday meeting? Or I feel like there's some process in between these lines of like, we get it from Linnaean, then what does it look like? When do we need to have review by? And what does all of that look like? Because it looks like there's kind of overlapping us reviewing slash them editing going on. This yes. You're, you're, yes, that is very um, perceptive and astute of you. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to uh, know when do I need to be ready to review and give, give feedback turned I, around and how quickly does that look? Yeah. That look like? I, so I would say it looks like you have a meeting on March 10th. So you get a draft on March 5th. I think the idea is to at least try to have some conversation on the 10th. Um, but it looks like. Um, so I can actually so you have till the 26th, right? Go ahead. Um, so, so, so this is part of the conversation we'll have a little bit later with the retreat. Um, but what, what I am in, what I was envisioning is we get it on the fifth. Um, I think together with the report, I'll circulate out some kind of comment collating document or sheet or something. Um, and, you know, it'll be where, com where everybody can add in their name and their comments and what section it's on. Um, you know, we're going to be focusing at, you know, task group or sector group co-chairs should sort of start with that, their, make sure they review their sector, but then also everybody's um, welcome and encouraged to review the whole document. I think this is this is really our chance, I think, to review the whole document. You know, we've talked a bit about we've done we've done most of our work so far in sector groups, which has been e efficient. Um, this is an opportunity to read, read through the whole thing. So we are gonna try to organize a um, retreat hopefully for that that weekend the 13th and 14th of March um I guess we could just have this conversation now seems easiest um does do Stephanie do you want to send out I guess we could just ask right now if anybody has like definite co conflicts with either of those days And if not, we'll send out a doodle poll to kind of figure out whether morning or afternoon works better for folks. But what I'm envisioning is that we will all do our own review, submit comments, and we'll spend that retreat kind of going through the comments together and making sure 
there's no nothing conflicting, you know, discuss anything we need to discuss. We have our next ECAC meeting on the 17th. So that will be our, an opportunity to sort of finish up any of that comment, you know, any of that comment review that we don't get through during the retreat. Um, and we'll be ready to hopefully submit that well in advance of the 20, 26th. I can speak a little bit to people's responses about availability and it looks like um, the 13th and 14th between two to four for the regular scheduled, regularly scheduled meeting time on the 10th are preferences. Okay, great. Um, I think if people are free that weekend, I'd, I'd like to push it to the weekend just so that gives us more time between the 5th and our retreat to do our, our review. So we'll pick one, one of those days, but, that, but that, that's the idea. Um, so hopefully we could get back our comments to Linnean by um, the 19th of March. Does that answer your question, Sarah? It does, yeah. <laughs> Great. Sorry, Andra, I think you had raised your hand and then I might have skipped over you. She might be away from her. You're muted, Andrew. She might have stepped away. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, I just just want to sort of emphasize that getting that draft by March fifth is very important, and. I would say to Linnean, even if it's not perfectly completed, they should get us what they've got by March 5th and not ask for another extension. And um, so we can at least start to read through it. If they have some revisions to present to us slightly after that, that would be okay, but we should get the bulk of it um, by March 5th. Hopefully that'll work for them. But as, as a professor, I often know when you when you give people an extension, they come back and seek another one. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't suspect that's going to happen this time. Okay. But I think um, I just think there were a few sections. Some of them are complete already, but again, they didn't want to piecemeal it, and so the other ones will be ready by then. But yeah, point well taken, Steve. I think we've got to get started um, yeah. then. So. Yeah, I was I was kind of inclined to ask if we could see some of those sections that are completed, um, so at least we get a jump on reviewing it. But um, that's fine if they want to wait and present the whole package on March fifth. It's fine with me. Yeah, I felt the same way, Steve. Yeah, I think there's benefits to. Um, having it all together. So, but maybe if there's parts, you know, I don't know, Let's see if there's stuff that we can get out earlier with the commenting document um, so people can start reading earlier, um, that might work too. So Stephanie and I can figure that out. But currently the plan is by the fifth having it, um, and together with the report, some kind of clear instructions on how to submit or to collect comments. Great, and then I think the other part of that whole process, so between the 5th and the 19th or the 26th when we get our feedback back to Lenan is gonna be, um, we're gonna need us to pencil in some time to talk through um, kind of community outreach 
and task group member, you know, they're going to receive portions or they're going to receive it to review as well. And sort of what I think it's always helpful when you're asking people to review a, a meaty document to um, kind of clarify the goals of their review. Like, what are we hoping that they're reviewing? Um, what, what, what we hope that they are looking for and providing feedback on, not to say that they can't look and provide feedback on whatever they want to, but giving them some direction is usually um, beneficial. So I'd like to talk through that with the group. Probably easier to do that once we get the draft, um, but that'll be something we either incorporate into the retreat or into our meeting on the 17th. Is that on March 5th, is that going to be publicly available? No. Or just for nope. East Casey and Townsend? Nope. Yes, exactly. Okay. So it's a fairly limited audience. Although if it goes out in the meeting packet, would it be public? But maybe it's not going out in the meeting packets? It, I wouldn't necessarily post it to the meeting packet. I would have just okay. sent it to all of you. Okay, that, that's good. I think then we have a more targeted group as we think about how we want to elicit and, and uh, focus feedback from town staff. Now, is, is that what level of town staff is that going to include? Is it going to go out to yeah. department directors like DPW and um, chief of police and that? It'll go to department heads, um, but also there was a, uh, during the MVP process, there was a core team that was uh, included the communications manager who isn't specifically a department head, but was included. So it'll it'll definitely okay. be focused on the members of the core team and then other department heads. Okay. Okay, great. If there's no other discussions to be had on this, we can move on here. Um, we just okay. So we will have our meeting on the tenth. Yeah, and then okay. So we'll have two meetings between. Okay, I guess I was getting confused. Sorry, we're meeting today and then we have a meeting scheduled on the 10th and on the 24th, right? Right, right. Yes. Okay, so um, if we have the retreat on the weekend of the 13th and 14th, then, and we don't finalize our review, then we would finalize anything on the 24th. Will you start to have some discussion on the 10th or no? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, potentially if folks are, are already, oh, I guess I can see how folks can submit some comments in advance um, and we could start that process and or we could use that opportunity to talk a bit about the community outreach. So um, think about that a little more how to organize all that. Other option, I guess, is to, um, move, things, move things around a little bit and do not have a meeting on the 10th, but then have a meeting on the 17th, if that worked for people's schedules. I just want to quickly tell Stephanie that Andrew's in the attendees and she wants to be let in. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, because she shows up as a telephone number. That's why. Sorry. That's okay. I didn't I didn't know that was her. I guess back to, to Laura's comment, my thought is that keep our meeting on the 10th as scheduled and hopefully we can at least have a we should be able to have a big scale or broad scale discussion of the draft and maybe then divide up some of the more detailed review responsibilities at the March 10th meeting. Um, but that at March 10th, we might just comment on if the 
their major sections missing or which sections initially look good, which sections need a lot more work, um, the tone of the intro, that, so some big picture stuff. And then maybe we can assign aspects of deeper view to, um, for the members to work on for a little bit later. Sorry, this is a housekeeping thing, but Andra, I cannot um, promote you to a panelist for some reason. So um, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I think you did and I had to unmute myself and that brought me in or something. Okay. Anyhow, good. All right, now you're with us, that's good. Okay, so yeah, let's plan on keeping our meeting on the 10th and we'll we'll go from there. I think we have a couple weeks to, to play with and I think we should have ample time to to provide comments. So I'm not too worried. And we'll send out a final time for the retreat. Um, probably, I guess, the 13th. Um, the Saturday? Saturday, yeah. And do you want a two hour retreat? Yeah, I think we should book two, two hours. If we don't need it all, great. More than that's hard to stay on Zoom for. For, for both days? No, just one day. Oh, do we know which one? You all could Want to do it now. <laughs> decide now. I mean, you know, you I, for the yeah. most part, two to four was the time frame that some people had a morning conflict. So um, two to four seemed to be the preferred time if people could do that on the 13th. Yeah. I'm ambivalent. We're indifferent. I'm indifferent too. I think sometimes on Sunday afternoons, I try to organize my life a little bit. So <laughs> Saturday afternoons, the better one. I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Um, so why don't we say the 13th from 2 to 4 p.m.? Sounds good. All right. Sunday's also daylight savings time. Yes. We might be too tired. Or daylight whatever, where they take away. <sighs> we lose time. I used to enjoy that in my younger days, and now that I'm a parent, it's like my worst nightmare. I know. Oh, it throws everybody off, yeah. I feel for you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sleep is precious. It is. No pun intended, but there is a light. <laughs> yes. Sorry, my puppy is playing with my wire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Andra, I don't know if you, I think you raised your hand to make a comment and then I don't know if I ever gave you that opportunity. So I don't know if- It's okay, it's, it's okay. I, I uh, <laughs> the time, the moment passed. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so that is great. So let's see. All right, so the next agenda item is housing policy goal. So I'll pull this up as well. Um, so just to recap, the CRC is working on a comprehensive housing policy. They've asked, they're sort of prepping ECAC to provide input, particularly on, I mean, we're welcome to provide input on anything, but particularly on goal four, which is on page, Thirteen. 13, yeah, Start, starts at the end of page 12. Um, I can, did they give a, a deadline for comments? So they are still in, as you can tell by this document here, um, 
they are still in drafting form. So they have not yet asked for kind of last and final comments on this. Um, so in that sense, no, they have not given a deadline. They, um, but I believe their intention, Stephanie, correct me if I'm messing this up, but I think their intention is to get a final version by June. So um, kind of given the shift in the report, it seemed like probably us talking about this today where we have some room on the agenda makes sense. And then once we get a final version to comment on, uh, we can send through any comments that we have now. Um, once we get a more final version, we can also comment, comment on that. I assume it will happen in April or something. Was this in the packet? Yes. How did I miss that? I don't know. It's in there. It's in there, but you have to scroll through like the beginning is not this document and then it gets to it. So the the title is 2021-02-04 CRC housing update to town committees. That's a yeah, I, I have the uh, uh, an earlier version of it that I was looking at. Uh, I don't this isn't the latest draft. It's what was sent to myself and Laura. So even the comments that we made aren't reflected yeah. in this version. So this was the latest version that I had. So I can just talk quickly and Stephanie also please add in to some of the comments we made when we met with them a few weeks ago, which, you know, were suggestions to, for example, for the strategies it's not necessarily about, re I mean, reducing carbon emissions is the goal, but for this policy, what we're actually talking about is making houses more energy efficient, less of an energy sink, um, you know, not reliant on fossil fuel technology that, you know, may become more and more expensive and or stranded asset as we move towards a low carbon economy. Um, we talked about charge, you know, um, charging stations, which are in here. And we also talked about with this medium priority about resiliency and low impact development, that that actually is not a medium priority. It's a high priority for making sure that we are leveraging as many green infrastructure and low impact development as much as much of that as we can um, with any new new buildings. I think that was the gist of it, Stephanie. Did I miss anything? No, I think you got it. Um, I, I don't know if this is the right time. Uh, I got to get back on my computer, but um, Stephanie and Steve, did you uh, see the um, graph that Cora sent us about the energy use in Amherst? And I didn't it look looks at it. Like, it. It looks like um, low income residents pay um, a much higher percentage than the Massachusetts average of their income on energy. So it's a very compelling data. Did you see that, Steve? I did, yes. Yes. Um, I'm trying to bring it up here. Um, where is it here? Oh, yeah. So, so um, Cora, who is our team leader for the Rocky Mountain Institute, um, provided some information from uh, the so-called LEAD tool, L-E-A-D tool, energy.gov, and it can provide hundreds of charts and comparisons on a fairly localized level. So she created some charts that show the energy burden by um, owners versus uh, renters and also by income level. 
And you want to share your screen, Steve? Sure. Um, let me see. I can go here to the Zoom webinar, share screen, and uh, there it is, and share. <coughs> okay. I don't really want to get too deep into the details of each of these charts. Um, it's something that the um, Andre and I and will be discussing with Cora on our meeting Friday. And I'm going to recommend that Ashwin might consider joining this group because we may be shifting more to look at energy and, and rental housing. Um, let's see if I could you zoom it in just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. doing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this, this chart is showing average energy burden, uh, Massachusetts versus Amherst. So Massachusetts are the blue um, columns and Amherst is the orange in different shades. And this uh, across the bottom is the, um, there's both renter occupied and owner occupied. So there's two sets of blue and orange bars. The set on the left is uh, renters and the pair on the right are owner. And then across the, the bottom is, um, AMI, which is uh, but, but, uh, uh, and medium income. Um, and so this is showing that renter occupied, what is it showing here? Um, Amherst is higher than most of Massachusetts. That's kind of the take home message for this. A across both renter and owner occupied and across all income brackets, Amherst has a higher energy burden than Massachusetts as a whole. Uh, and then she broke it out. The next chart here is just, this is just an Amherst by fuel type. Um, so the, again, there's across the bottom are the different income groups. 100% on the far right, that's 100% of the median income. 100% uh, and greater than median income. So the lower income are to, on the left side of the chart. And you can see the energy burden is, and is a percent of income. So for the lowest income on the far left, you can see it's 20 to 24 percent, and there's a breakout of the different kinds of fuels there. But when you get closer to the median income on the right side of the chart, that energy burden is down in the four to five percent range, roughly. So that's showing that renters have a higher energy burden, um, propane and fuel oil, as well as other. I'm not quite sure what other is, and then. Uh, what is this one showing? This one is showing energy burden again. Uh, again, a low income tends to have that higher energy burden. The energy costs are higher as a percentage of their total income. Oh, this is by the style of unit. So a single unit on the left, one unit attached, two units, three units, all the way up to 50 or more units. So some of the highest energy burdens are associated with single units, but she does note that's a it's very small per, uh, percent of the total population has that very high rental or, or energy burden. Um, stop me if we wanna move on, there's more details here. So yeah, so then there's some conversation that we're gonna have about rental efficiency standards. And this is something that we've talked a little bit about in ECAC, but that would be, related to potential energy disclosure laws and even if um, standards. And there's great examples of other communities that have established this. Um, Boulder, Colorado, Portland, Oregon, um, Portland, Maine, that the Linnaean helped um, produce. And draw your attention, this site here, rmi.org rental-toolkit provides a nice sort of a handbook on how to develop a, uh, and implement rental efficiency standards, required rental efficiency standards, um, both benchmarking, publicizing, and then also mechanisms to achieve improvements in energy efficiency over time. Um, I found that really interesting. I spent a fair bit of time studying that. And some of the information I think that I sent you, which I think Laura sent out just a few minutes ago, was just a two page extract from this website that highlighted uh, the aspects of creating rental efficiency standards. Um, so I was pleased. I think this is a great strategy. I hope to learn more through RMI and maybe they might even set up a similar thing as they did for the electrification where we might get a group of towns in, Amer uh, in, in Massachusetts all trying to do the same thing and with some RMI 
help, we can work together to develop something that can be um, implemented. I'll stop there if people have any questions. Thank you so much, Steve. This is, this is awesome. Um, I just real quick, I was opening and closing doors, switching to my computer right when you said uh, something about a meeting that uh, <laughs> I might wanna join and I totally missed what that was. So I would, uh, could you just repeat that real quick? Yeah, you're gonna be leading this meeting on Friday that, um, <laughs> <laughs> now this is, um, Andra and I have been participating in this Rocky Mountain Institute um, team that was focused on electrification and we've sort of cleared the hurdle on that as that is now included in the statewide bill and we're hoping for progress on that. But the, uh, our, our coach, whose name is Cora, is um, we're sort of shifting the discussion to explore these uh, energy standards and rental, for, for, uh, sorry, energy efficiency standards for rental buildings and perhaps commercial buildings as well. Um, and that meeting is scheduled for this Friday at what time? Um, uh, getting there. Three o'clock. Three o'clock, isn't it? Three. Yeah, three o'clock. Right, right. And in addition to Andra and I, it's also Chris Riddle and uh, Felicia Mednick have been um, joining those conversations. So it's a fun group. It's a good group. And, and Cora has been really helpful as the coach of that group. So I will send Cora a note and have her at least send you an invitation, Ashwin, and then you can see about it fitting into your schedule. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Seems like some of these elements are worth adding to the list. Um, you know, suggestions to the CRC. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah currently really well. Yeah, I'm thinking we could even just share this document with with them, with that committee, because um, it looks like there's some useful data in there. But I, uh, uh, but I also think that you know this this came up. You know, Ash, both Ashwin and Andra brought this up or things around this issue up during the big idea discussion. The CRC is working on this policy. It feels like this is a really ripe area to focus in and identify some like specific actions that we can take both that the council can take, but also I think Darcy, your earlier discussion, if there's anything around funding specific to this that we need, I don't know if we need funding per se, but um, I think this would be a good area to focus in on. Yeah, Ashwin. I sorry, I can't okay. see everybody's faces, so people should yeah. also jump in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure if this would be helpful, and may maybe the RMI people kind of know all about this and kind of have all the answers already. But if they don't, I would be interested in doing some research on the process uh, that it took to get that ordinance passed in Burlington specifically, and maybe some other municipalities. Um, so if if the, if that would be helpful, I would be down to sign up for that task. Yeah, if you check out that toolkit that I was highlighting, the RMI toolkit, they, they present some case studies and they present also sort of a series of step-by-step -step, um, actions to take and even a policy blueprint that you can download and fill out um, specific to your town. Um, one of the things they do mention is that as you get into, you wanna be able to do a, a, a housing study and kind of look at the bang for the buck and consider what level of efficiency standards you might try to implement. And they describe that as something like a $50,000 study. So that could come forward as a possible budget item. Great. Um, OK, so it sounds like. Um, Steve, you're going to connect Ashwin with the RMI group, and maybe you could share this document as well. Um, yes, why don't we, I can share it now with the committee, but it might, we might want to look at it and sort of focus it a little bit more at our meeting on Friday and make it even better to share with the committee. 
um, following that meeting. Yeah, if you could come up with, you know, a few items that you think we should add to the list for the CRC. Yeah. That would be, that seems like it would be a good idea. And at the point that we're ready, it, that the accelerator group is ready to share the document, I would also forward it on to Linnean. Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I, I I, this, I'm thinking. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. sorry. Oh, I'm I'm just thinking that um, it, like the CRC has a lot of things that they deal with. You know, the the housing isn't the only thing. So, uh, if we can, you know, provide it all, but but sort of do a, a cover letter of what we think is most relevant for us, um, that I think would be helpful. Does that make sense? Things that works well for Amherst is we already have a rental licensing program and those, those um, rentals have to be licensed every year. So that provides the perfect mechanism for adding on to for rental efficiency standards. Um, and so I don't know exactly how that rental licensing program was developed a few years ago, but I can imagine we might do something similar to that process, which it will take time, but we'll have to develop a group of people that might include the inspections department and, and local real estate uh, folks and, and property owners and kind of collectively come up with a plan that at some point in the future could be a year or so away would present a plan to town council for ratification. The rental program started in the inspections department <clears throat> with the oh. current building commissioner. And How long did that take to develop, Stephanie? Do you remember? <clears throat> it was probably, I would say, easily a full year. Yeah. Um, but it was a lot of outreach to a lot of landlords. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. And that takes time, getting response you know, responses was, it just took a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, and this may take even longer. It has the potential for putting a burden on property owners um, to complete surveys of their properties. And, and um, they may be worried about what the costs of upgrading to a, an efficiency standard would be. And we wanna make sure during this process that it doesn't cause rents to increase above and beyond um, what, what energy savings tenants might see. And these are things that have all are discussed in the case studies that the RMI toolkit um, put together. Yeah, and I think um, in terms of the CRC housing policy, I, I think it's it would be helpful if we wanted to get in, you know, they have this priority of reducing emissions. So maybe we, edit one of these bullet points or suggest a new bullet point very specific to, to this project. Um, so I think it's not that necessarily CRC would do it, but I think if it's included in their policy and in our plan, you know, then we're sort of moving towards larger buy-in that this is the direction we need to go in. Yes, I think that's good. If, if CRC includes it, that could give, um, an incentive to inspections department and perhaps us to work together to flesh out the details of a plan. Does it make sense for our building group or the people that are focused on buildings to to take the um, take the request from the CRC and and um, look at it further for edits and add whatever Stephen, Stephen Andra, well, who's on that committee? Steve and we're the co-chairs of the building, Jesse and Steve? No. no wasn't Jesse me. and Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, um, anyway, uh, it seems like we should have a little subgroup working on coming up with what our response is to the CRC. I, you know, I, I have comments about the, the um, 
the list as it stands right now, um, I think that it's 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 a little tricky because it's really inter entwined with its zoning and planning recommendation that it put forward. Um, so it to the extent that we could stay away from the politics of it, I think would be good. Um, and uh, so, I, yeah, I guess I just feel like um, it. The the version that we have it needs needs a little bit more work and the opportunity for us to comment on it. And it makes sense for our, our building people to take it on, but maybe they don't have don't want to or don't have the capacity. I don't know. Yeah, so I think one, I think there's a good suggestion there, Darcy, which is that um, what, what we don't want, I think what we want to accomplish is for the, at a minimum, right, the CRC housing plan not to contradict what's in the CARP plan, and at a maximum be really aligned and help push each, you know, sort of provide more um, kind of a backup for the work that we're, we're putting in our plan related to building and housing. So I think we should review would be so maybe, um, and we have to the time. So I think as we review our, our report, somebody, whether it's Jesse or Sarah, or maybe somebody just will, will volunteer their time to kind of cross check that with this plan. So what I'll put on my list to do is get an update from Mandy Jo um, so we can do that cross check with the most up-to-date version when, when the time is right, which will be at some point while we're reviewing the report or after we review the report. What, what level of detail would be included in the CRC recommendations with regard to a plan like this? Would it be a, basically a one sentence statement that a group will be developing a rental building efficiency standard and bringing it to town council or would it be more detailed in the CRC plan? Given the text that they currently have, I imagine it would be one sentence and pretty high yeah. level. So like right okay. now it says for community choice aggregation, for example, utilize community choice aggregation to provide clean energy. So I imagine it would be just a sentence. I think, yeah, I, I hope so too. And I think then it, that could be very broad. And then we could assemble a group that includes some of us, folks from inspections and who knows who else to really maybe working with the RMI um, coach to then develop it and go through the steps that the um, in the RMI toolkit to develop that plan over the next months. And I think Jesse would probably have some interest and expertise on this. They, um, they use either the HERS building assessment or the HES building assessment, which I, he has talked about um, as a way of assessing efficiency of buildings. Yeah, Dwayne. Yeah, I was just, um, and I, I know we're not sort of um, commenting too, in too much detail on the CRC strategies yet, but uh, just throw out there and to, to, to incorporate what Steve has been talking about in terms of these energy efficiency programs and, and, and um, 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 regular rules or whatever is uh, um, is really important, but I would add because I'm reading this and it talks about net zero, um, and I think I think I'd like to see a little bit more uh, explicit language about trying uh, to encourage or regulate or somehow um, replace uh, fossil fuel boilers in these buildings. Um, because that's that's going to be the big transition needed to get to the carbon reductions we need. They go hand in hand with energy efficiency because uh, they're hard to do without energy efficiency. And if you're doing an energy efficiency retrofit, that's a pretty good time to 
swap out to um, heat pumps um, or whatever. Um, and I think that's more the goal than net zero, especially for retrofits. Um, we don't wanna discourage people from not doing it because they can't get to net zero because um, they can't put, you know, they might not have room for PV on the roof or something. Uh, but we still want them to swap out oil boilers, gas boilers, for um, heat pumps and so forth. Um, so I just just reading the list of the high priority list, I didn't see um, something that was a little bit more explicit about this transition to um, renewable thermal technologies. Yeah, that's a good point, Twain. And we did talk a bit about you know as we were looking through this together there's just this one bullet point on retrofitting, but it was kind of recognized that maybe there's not enough focus on existing buildings. Um, and so this would be a good addition to that. And I think point well taken. And we did talk about sort of focusing the language more on those tangible items of like reducing energy costs and reducing a reliance on fossil fuels versus reducing carbon emissions, which is a little bit too like vague for, for the, doesn't explain as well what the, the goal is. The, the programs that I have seen for rental building efficiency standards don't attempt to go to net zero for existing buildings. Um, they, they shoot for improvements. And in some cases, there are caps on how much uh, a property owner has to spend in order to make progress. Um, so it's, I think that was Burlington, I'm not, I can't remember, but there are standards for how much uh, improvement or what level of efficiency is required in order to maintain your rental license. And those are things that we can work out um, through discussions and, and analysis of existing buildings. And, and then those standards can also be ratcheted up every five or 10 years. So um, buildings continue to grow more efficient and that would provide a long enough time frame where building owners could then think about replacing some of those major things like, like boilers, um, not necessarily in the first year of the program, but they could think about doing it within 10 years after the program has started, uh, for example. And I think that's a there's an opportunity there to maybe bring in um, Andra's idea from last time about the database and like the tracking. You know, could we build an opportunity for landlords to provide information about the age and stuff of their equipment, and then help them identify when it's time to upgrade and things like that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's typically included in the energy surveys that are done for each of either the HES or HERS assessments. Um, mm. in, in both cases, an inspector goes through the building and notes the levels of insulation, the types of windows, the size of the building, as well as the efficiency of the heating, the HVAC systems. Uh, they do not base the ratings on actual energy bills, so it's not based on um, what the tenants might be doing in the building. It's really based on the structure of the building. So that, that's why they liken it to or compare it to a miles per gallon ratings for vehicles. <coughs> guide that you can compare different buildings, but your mileage will vary depending on your, your habits or your tenants habits. <clears throat> this is this report that Cora pulled together is really amazing for how much data is already available. And um, yeah, yeah, you got to thank her. Boy. Yeah, we'll thank her on Friday when we talk with her. Yeah, that's great. So I think. I've heard a couple action items. Um, one is that Steve will connect with Ashwin about the meeting. Ashwin has offered to do some more research on some of these other towns, you know, by looking through this information. 
um, and anything else. And I think given the interest in this, the work of RMI, the work of the CRC on the policy, it seems like this is definitely floating up as one of the things that we want to focus on um, trying to move move in some way. Um, am I mischaracterizing that? There's a lot of synchronicity at the regional and state level too, because this is an interest that um, you know the CCA group has talked about, and um, it, it's also something that is now you know a state goal for um, major climate organizations to pass legislation to help make this kind of thing happen. Is there, um, this could be, of course, part of our report and then could feed into um, another MVP implementation grant. Sorry, I'm getting the wrong words for the 50K that um, Steve mentioned to do the, the, the housing stock study, right? Is that what that was for, Steve? Yeah, so I'd have to double check exactly what that was for, as was described in the RMI toolkit, but it was. Yes, I think it was a housing uh, study. Would there be any any other place we could we could get that money? Maybe Darcy, looking to you. No, looks like maybe state programs, um, it, but I don't know. Yeah, that, that's some other research to, to be done to look at, you know, just start talking with um, DOER about things that are coming up. Stephanie, do you know the um, timeline for MVP, so I know like we, we submit everything in the end of June. It, is there some kind of like waiting period for when we can up start a, to apply for additional grants? No, they have, in fact, they, they're they changing their format a little bit. And now you just have a letter of interest that you submit first. And I think they're trying to sort of narrow the the pool of funding that they're, they're distributing to. So, um, that's actually, there's one actually coming up now and we could throw something in and I wasn't saying anything earlier, but I have had in my mind about the um, solar, solar resiliency that we had thought about applying to FEMA for, submitting that for um, at least a letter of interest regarding that, um, which might touch on the, um, resident capital request. We might be able to sort of wrap that in, especially if it's through the MVP program. I think it feels to me like there might be a little more leeway in terms of where we could get the study, that more sort of intense engineering study done and possibly incorporate implementation as part of it too, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, and then um, I will re reach out to Mandy Joe and just see when an updated version will be available of this so that we can provide more detailed comments consistent with our um, report. In the, in the meantime, is there somewhere that I can send comments? As, as like Darcy or as ECAC, or as, as myself to our whoever is, you know, our <laughs> our joint effort. Yeah, I mean, to I guess I'm confused by the question. To yeah, make I just have some editing comments about 
that section. And um, so just wondering what I should do with them. Yeah, so we can collect those. And if somebody, I think we haven't yet had somebody from ECAC volunteer to kind of take the lead on providing ECAC specific comments, but I imagine the process would be that whoever does that, you know, we provide comments to them and they pull them all together and we review them as a committee. Um, I mean, this is a public document on the CRC website. So if you wanted to provide comments just as Darcy, you, you're also, of course, anybody's welcome to do that. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to submit a round of comments now and then submit a round of comments later or not. Um, we could, if Darcy, if you wanna send your comments, we can send them in with Dwayne's, Dwayne's note and just this, the, the mention that we're working on something related to renter um, efficiency standards and we'll be in touch with more information, but you know, it, it is still a work in progress. So I think comments are welcome. I just don't know if- um, when, you, when you say send them in, do you mean to Stephanie? Comments on this document, I would, I assume would go to the CRC, right? Yeah, aren't you talking about to Mandy Jo or Dave or whoever? Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm attempting to help shape the ECAC document. The ECAC document. Whatever comments we're going to give to them eventually. So um, I hear you saying that, we're, that you would like us to wait until we get a more final version. I think there's two things to wait wait on one is getting our our report so that we are kind of aligning i think the more aligned these two documents are the better so the more that the language we're using in our report is also reflected in the policy the better so i think um we want to provide comments that so i think we need to wait to, to be able to provide those comments yeah. Um, and they might have, in, in the meantime, they might also have an updated version. So I want to reach out to them to me. I'll reach out to Mandy Joe and find out if they're going to have an updated version before mid-March. If they're not, then we should take your comments, Darcy, and any comments that come after we review our report and pull them all together and maybe our meeting on the 17th or the 24th. Am I getting those dates right? Um, the 10th or the 24th, we can go through them, probably the 24th. Okay, that sounds good. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I was, I'm hoping to focus the, the, um, you know, incentivizing net zero, not just to new multifamily developments, but to new construction. Um, and I yeah, think that did come up in our discussion that that definition was too narrow. Yeah, um, and I think that that the discussion, wherever it is talking about density, uh, encouraging or, or incentivizing density uh, and, and new development, I think we have to tread carefully there because um, uh, we obviously are, we obviously as ECAC would promote density in village centers or whatever, um, but it's sort of a question of whether we're promoting new development, is that sustainable? Or whether we want to say we're needed because some of, some of the language here is promoting new development. And I'm not convinced that that is sustainable unless it's shown that it's needed. Um, so, um, and there's also just the issue of should we be 
you know, like <laughs> it's sort of like downtown versus promoting density at UMass. Um, so that that's the tricky political piece where, you know, we're gonna run into half the town wanting one thing and half the town wanting another. Uh, so I, I guess I just feel like we need to think that piece through where we're talking about density. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, I agree. I think those can be potentially uh, political landmines, but at least as far as contributing to the CRC document, I don't think we have to, the ECAC should not come across as promoting density or development in particular areas. That could be done by others. We should, though, provide guidelines that when development occurs, it, right. new development should be net zero. Yes, absolutely. Ex so, existing yeah. development should be brought up to standards. Um, so we avoid. Yes. <laughs> so, oops, sorry. We can just add that language, uh, you know, to make it conditional. Ashwin, did you put your hand raised? Uh, yeah, no, basically echoing that. I, I agree. Um, I don't think we need to trigger this landmine, even even if we are pro <laughs> growth. You know, I'm always imagining and thinking about the fact that there's going to be several hundred million climate refugees in the next couple decades. And I do think that we need to house them, but maybe other people in Amherst don't want to house climate refugees for some sort of reason that I can't possibly fathom. So can avoid that. Yeah, and, and I would agree too. And I think, um, Darcy, I think this is where you're kind of straddling your counselor hat and your ECAC hat. I mean, I don't think ECAC needs to take on this political landmine. This is not our policy. <laughs> so, um, but you will have to take it on likely in some role and capacity as a counselor, right? So um, I think we should be, fo we should focus in on making sure whatever development has or does or doesn't happen or retrofits do or don't happen are done. Right. In line with that. Yep. Okay, great. So I think we've sort of combined agenda item six and seven for at least at least part of that in terms of identifying this one item that we wanna wanna work on. Um which is great. I think this will really be, could be an impactful place to focus in some of our efforts and activities. Um, I don't know if folks wanted to had a chance after reflecting on our discussions last time or looking at the notes from the discussions, if there's anything else that's popping out as something that we really should um, bring to the forefront of our um, our work over the next several months. I, I'll note that you know I saw and I think Darcy, you forwarded it to to me as well, and Stephanie the additional rebates for electric vehicles at the heavy duty or medium duty sort of range. Um, so that could be something that we've, that ties into my big idea around maybe trying to help smaller businesses that have fleets, um, you know, access some of those grants and rebates so they're transitioning their fleets. Um, I don't know if there's anything else, maybe Andra, that you think is, is bubbling up on the state level that would be good for us to also focus in on, um, and Ashwin, I don't know if you're still raised from before or if you have another comment. Nope, sorry, I'm, that was from before. Okay, um, yeah, Andra and then Darcy. Um, well, so this isn't what you just asked, um, <laughs> but I did wanna um, bring up, um, the transportation issue that uh, we may want to weigh in on um, the school budget 
capital budget included a line item um, for another bus. I mean, we've got like nine buses and they last about nine or 10 years. <laughs> so <laughs> pretty much every year they got it in there, every other, anyhow. Um, it's, um, and it's for a diesel bus. It's like what, 95,000, whatever. Um, and so that issue is going to come back. Um, like, can't we plan for how we're going to move ahead? Maybe the next bus can't be electric, but could we try and and have a plan in place for the next school bus after that? If not, you know, it's just like this. This is going to just just keep happening and. There's got to be a way to put a little bookmark in here. And as far as what's happening at the state level, it's just all, you know, beginning. The legislation was just filed. Um, there's comments being taken from um, the administration on their clean energy and the ECP climate plan um, this next in the next month. I could forward more information about that if people are interested. I personally haven't really done the dive into that, um, but I'm sure there's very rel much related stuff. I'm done. <laughs> Darcy, sorry. Well, I was just going to add um, that, you know, I, and I know you've brought this up before, Laura, that if in any way we could focus on um, different means of fundraising and, or maybe finding out what other towns do, seeing um, how what is a green bond and how does it work? <laughs> you know, all the different forms of, um, you know, major fundraising that other towns have done in order to fund climate initiatives. Um, it seems like that is key. Um, because grants only go so far and then they run out. Um, you know, we, we, need, we need some continuous fundraising. And I mentioned to, to Laura that the, the reparations group in Amherst, um, or actually they, they, the reparations group in Evanston, Illinois, um, has, uh, is funded through um, the revenue that, the, that Evanston gets from their marijuana sales. Uh, so, you know, like just, ideas, ideas about revenue streams where we could get money to do some of this stuff because, um, you know, we can ask the taxpayers to pay for it, uh, but it would be nicer if we could figure something in addition to that, you know, out. Um, so that's a whole area of research and um you know and work for someone yeah who do you be, oh go ahead i just out of curiosity um because uh, it, it's something i've been thinking about as well but in that reparations <clears throat> um agreement in evan evanston um that's the revenue source but do you do you do you, do you know what the form of the reparations are then that is provided to the um, I um, think the black population. I think that it's um, it 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 isn't like cash to individuals. It's it's divided into different sectors of housing, education, and social services, and so on. Goes into different different categories. Um, yeah, it's extremely well organized. I'm, I'm I just be inclined to um, maybe Ashwin's talk, but buy them all a PV system. Yeah, yeah. And, and that yeah. way we we solve our our problem, and then they have they have 
um, perpetual low lower costs. Yes, yes, it could definitely be combined. Yeah. I mean, not to say that they don't need uh, some preparations on education and other services, but you know, this is a uh, something that we could think about. Yeah, I um, I have a. There's I just googled paying for electric buses and this document came up, um, that I can share with the group from 2018. Um, yeah, I don't know who like who. How do we push that conversation forward, in a way that's productive? Like, is there some like, and who, who's the response, who's responsible for that, I guess, is, is kind of my question. Like, would it be the finance committee? Would it be like a different group? Would it be like a subcommittee of like, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out like, how can we, cause I like toss this idea out like as much as I can, but an ECAC could, you know, come up with something, but I feel like it needs to be a larger effort. Stephanie, do you know anything about the DEP um, VW grant offering, whether that second round is has happened or is projected to? Um, I haven't seen anything from it. Um, I'm still wrapping up our first purchase. In fact, I just submitted our final um, report to them, final invoice information. So, um, I, you know, I can now that I'm that's wrapped up. I can sort of look into it. Um, but usually, I get notification, and I don't think I've seen anything about it because mm -hmm. I've been trying to pay attention because I do feel like that's something we would try to pursue again. I do think, though, I have a recollection that somehow it was going to be a little more restrictive this time, in a good way, in a way that we would prefer. So. I don't, DPW got a roll off vehicle approved last time. I don't know that they would get to do that this time. It might be only for electric this next round. Yeah, Steve. A, a funding idea that I would favor is to take some of the money that's coming to the town as um, pilots, payments in lieu of taxes from some of the solar developments. Um, you know, Hampshire College pays some of that and see if we might get some of that dedicated to specific projects that ECAC is implementing, um, as well as seeing if we can maybe in a little while get some of the, the money coming in off of the town to be developed PV projects, either the landfill or on the Hickory Golf Course property. I know some of those have already been earmarked and it's sort of a bloodbath to try to fight for portions of that. And what they've been earmarked for is also important, but maybe we could request that in X number of years, maybe a slice of that could be shared with ECAC and probably best to ask for it to be shared for specific projects as opposed to a budget for ECAC to do things. The more specific these re proposal requests are, I think, the more likely they'll be um, honored or, or granted. Yeah, I had hopes for the solar landfill funds, given how much time I've spent on that <laughs> right. over all these years. And I was told, and I, I'm assuming this is true, and I haven't heard anything contrary, that it was dedicated to the solid waste fund because it's on the landfill. So, you know, nothing for, nothing for us. Well, let's- I mean, it is, but it's ask. tangentially. No, I agree. I, I, don't, I don't disagree at all. Um, like I said, I was rather deflated <laughs> when, I, when I heard you, that. You should um, get half of that as a, as a year bonus. To you just get a little something <laughs> for us, but- um, I, I don't disagree. You know, I just think you have to sort of be very specific about what you're asking for. Yeah, yeah, and and not and not pan the things that it is also going for because those, as you said, are, are important. Right. Um, 
but but if we can put something in line for a year or two out, that sort of lets the idea grow and becomes more palatable and more possible if you have a, an extended time frame. And if it's if it's something specific like electric school buses, that makes it even a bit more, I think, attractive and doable. Maybe the solid waste fund could be dedicated to zero waste initiatives. I don't know that it would be specifically dedicated to that. I mean, they don't even, the solid waste fund is what used to support having a recycling coordinator. So I would hope that maybe this means that we might get somebody again. I don't, I don't know. That would be nice. Yeah. yeah, but I don't. I don't know for sure what the intentions are. I just how do how do we find out? Yeah, I yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I can I can start asking because okay. now that it's coming to more of a reality of being installed, I can sort of reach out to find out what happens to those funds. It, okay, and so the. Um... Is this for the new landfill project or or not Hickory Ridge for the Lake new Ridge. yeah the new the quote unquote new landfill, Belcher Town Road. Um, right. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm also. I mean, when it comes to if it hasn't already passed, when it comes comes time to negotiate that pilot, um, uh, I think this group can uh, might have some uh, things to offer. Uh, the, uh, for, for whoever does the ne negotiating. For the Hickory Ridge project you're talking about? Uh, for any of the solar projects that the, you know, is, that the town is sort of uh, uh, leading and is on third, that they expect to get a pilot from. Uh, from my opinion, um, there's a lot more that can be um, drawn out from these solar developers and, and, and tax equity uh, financers and they leave pittance to the towns. Um, and um, uh, I, it's worth pushing back and, and making a strong argument for, for more. Maybe it's not, you know, uh, upfront because they're they're sort of getting their rate of return in the early years, but a hefty uh, and a growing pilot um, amount over over time. Um, uh, I it would be worthwhile to try to um, um, develop strong negotiating uh, uh, stances on that uh, and to push the developers on that. Because that's real revenue for the town uh, that could be used, you know, not just for like a position, uh, but even to, you know, start funding other projects, um, meaningful projects. Yeah, I'm liking this idea even more. Um, and I, I think if the town citizens knew that some of these solar projects were supporting popular things like electric school buses. They might, might more of them might be favorable to future solar development projects. Um, so I think exploring that is something that maybe ECAC wants to figure out how to do and not leave it to Stephanie on her own to try to work out. If she can ferret out some information, that would be useful, but maybe we come up with a particular proposal and the school bus one seems like one that's concrete and fairly immediate, and um, could be tried out as and see how it how it works. Yep, Stephanie, I can share some of the stuff I've been doing with the uh, that NREL grant as well on the on the financial um, uh, options in terms of um, ownership and flip models and uh, pilot agreements and so forth. Sure. With that. Sorry. Um, are there any other solar projects sort of in the pipe, Stephanie? The Hickory Ridge is the big one. Um, and that's the only one that I'm aware of right now. And that's not the landfill. No, right. the landfill is something different. And that's, I mean, that negotiation is long gone. That's ready to be developed. <laughs> We've been saying this for a while, but it really is, I swear. Um, we're just sort of waiting on Eversource at this point, but you know, all the permitting has been done. It's actually, I think um, it had gone out to bid and there are potential developers now um, 
bidding on the project. So. Um, they, but they haven't accepted a bid yet. They're, they're receiving bids. This is, this is the con. So this is Cypress Creek who we've been dealing with. Yeah are subcontracting for the de development of the actual structure. Construction, okay. Construction, right, so yeah. yeah. So that's who they're um, bidding out to right now. Oh, I see. So it is moving forward. You know, if Eversource is settled on the uh, interconnection agreement and costs? Um, no, I don't. Yeah. That's something that almost tripped up the development at Hampshire College because Eversource came back and said, oh, geez, you're gonna have to pay 2 million bucks to do for studies and interconnection connection uh, costs. Yep. And had, had, to, had to pony up that money and we got most of it back because most of it wasn't needed, but it was a big delaying um, problem. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, actually I shouldn't say that. I think, again, because Cypress Creek is working with them, yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't know every little detail at every turn but I'm I'm pretty sure actually that they already did actually agree on that but um, I don't know the exact details some of it they don't share <laughs> so yeah. yeah that's kind of deep in the weeds yeah but yeah don't I don't trust ever source with these things <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're alone <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not as bad. Did you read about Maine? Central Maine Power Authority started um, back charging solar development projects, hundreds of thousands of dollars for interconnection costs. Back charging, that's, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. And it, what, once the newspapers broke it, then then the executive said, oh, gee, it was the mid-level engineers. <laughs> okay. It was their fault, yeah. All right, so it's it sounds like there is I mean, I think there's this larger conversation about funding, what different funding sources are out there, whether we're exploring all the different ways of not using taxpayer funding or redistributing taxpayer funding or doing debt service or whatever. Um, a lot of those are larger than ETAC, but important to our work for sure. And um, but then in specifically these pilot payments in lieu of taxes for solar projects, if that's something we can work on for upcoming projects. Um, I would just add to that. I mean, in addition to pilots, I mean, this very much goes into the realm of the um, CCA as well uh, with regard to, you know, the vision of you know, trying to bring in some of these solar projects as supply for the CCA um, and some financial um, opportunity for more local ownership of those assets through through an organization like the CCA. Um, so I wouldn't limit it to just um, negotiating a better pilot. Good point. Um, all right, I think we're nearing the end of our time and agenda. Um, so we have a couple action items to follow up on and you know we'll be looking for the looking forward to getting the report in, at the end of next week. Um, I want to give Stephanie a little time before her next meeting. Um, so is there any other last minute thoughts or questions? I don't see anything. So um, so we'll follow up with, um, I think Steve and Ashwin are gonna connect on the rental um, efficiency program ideas. Um, Darcy, if you wanna send any link, any, any comments you already have about the CRC thing, because you have them ready, just send them. But we'll plan on addressing that as we go through the report. And next week we'll send around the report and sort of the the way that we're going to do comments, which we'll dig into a little bit more on the tenth as well. So that sounds good to everybody. And the retreat is going to be scheduled for the thirteenth from two to four, and we'll get a reminder from Stephanie about that. Probably right. Yeah, I'll send up a Zoom meeting and send that all, and I'll have to post it. 
Great. All right. If there's nothing else, I think we can call it a call it a meeting. Any On public comment? Okay. Oh, public comment. I don't know. Yeah, she's no, sure. I think uh, our public left. So <laughs> public. Yeah. Well, great meeting. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a Thank good night. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, Laura. Everybody, take care. Bye all. Bye. Bye. Bye.